Andrew was, teased, was joking around and saying, no, we're going to hear about how to kill a bear bear. <laughs> so that is, what, that is what the talk should really be called. Some of my first bonsais were baobabs, which I grew from seed. And, um, and, a, and these are a couple of them outside. But I, I feel quite passionate on the subject of teaching people more about baobabs because had I known what I know now, I could have shaved like, I could have been where I am now 15 years ago at least. So you can really get results very quickly with baobabs. Um, if, if you know what they're capable of. And they are very different from other trees in many ways. Okay, so I just want to slip, flip through some, some photographs that many of you would recognize. Famous baobabs around Southern Africa. Um, but I want you to pay attention to the form that these baobabs take. Often multi-trunks like this. They've got extremely, if you look at the proportions, they're often, often wider than they are tall. Um, often with these very deeply fluted trunks. You know, you know what I mean by that? These cavities into the, into the main trunk. Um, the way that the branches bend down under their own weight is also characteristic of, of really old trees. Um, this is a particularly beautiful one, and you can see the type of fine ramification you get. But again, you get this, this effect of the branches drooping under their own weight. Um, and pier nef, we all know, uh, you know, the pier nef style in bonsai, um, which, you know, Charles Saronia was, was really hot on this. And, um, you know, he took a lot of examples from pier nef. I particularly love this, this woodblock, um, or lana cut, I'm not sure what it was, lana, I think, um, that pier nef made. But, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to see those forms interpreted by an artist who's, who's having to, to, to look carefully at a tree and understand that structure. Um, yeah, Chapman's baobab, this one, unfortunately, has collapsed. Um, so those, I think there were seven trunks in there, and, and evidently the whole thing has, has collapsed. Still alive, some of the trunks. Um, I think this is another angle of the same tree. Now, when you look more closely, they've got this uh, characteristic bark. It's quite soft and spongy to the touch, actually. Um, it's almost like it's, it's got a waxy feel, quite different to the bark of other trees. And it looks almost, it looks like candle wax in many ways. Um, take a look at, um, at, at these, for example. This is all natural, natural, uh, you know, natural structures on these, on these babies. And look, that looks almost like wax that's run down the side there. Um, so, I've mentioned a lot of this already. They are generally wider than they are tall. And that's something that I think we need to pay attention to if we're going to um, make convincing uh, baobab style trees. And this is not necessarily just, of course, using the Adansonias you, there's an example outside, one of Sean's trees, which is a, a camifera styled in the baobab style. Um, so I think that all of this applies, whether you, as I say, whether you're using the, the baobab uh, actual species or not. These deeply fluted trunks, um, and many with multiple trunks, um, and those are really the famous baobabs. Um, the trunk generally doesn't taper. If anything, it's got an inverse taper. And that sort of runs counter to everything that you learn about, you know, what makes a really great bonsai is, you know, you need to have this tapering trunk. This is not the case with baobabs. Um, I've mentioned the, 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 uh, the curving down, have I lost my laser pointer? The curving downwards of the branches. And there is fine branch ramification, but I mean, that's all secondary to the trunk. And I've spoken about that lovely, um, that lovely bark and the texture of the bark of an old tree. And a lot of that as well is, 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 a, is an adaptation to dealing with being uh, ring barked by elephants. Um, these are the, um, I've forgotten what the, the species name of this, but, uh, but there's seven or eight different species of baobab. All the ones I've shown you so far are digitata, 
um, the, the African species. Madagascar has got half a dozen species of baobab, and there's one in, in Australia. And they've, they've got uh, slightly different growth characteristics. And, um, and these, you know, this style is, um, is what you most often find with, um, with baobab trees. Um, and I mean, I can talk a little bit about just why that is, but th this is very beautiful as well. But it's they've got these very tall trunks and then only the, the branching structure right at the top. Another photograph of those Mad Madagasy uh, baobabs. Sorry, I've forgotten what the... That's it, thank you. Okay. So, um, outside, uh, there's a baobab there that I... I can show you guys that was one of the original ones that I started with. Um, it's been in a pot its whole life. It will take a while to get girth on the trunk. So yeah, you, you need to, um, as I say, start young and plan to live long. Um, growing them in the ground. If you've got a square foot of open garden space and you're in a climate that allows you to grow them throughout the winter without frost and so on, you plant it in the ground, and you very rapidly get a thick trunk. Um, and then I've, I'll show you photographs of the process of then dealing with, the, with a tree that's been growing in the ground. Something that I tried uh, a lot of in the early days was trying to, you know, cutting branches off and trying to get them to root from cuttings. And I had no success at all. Until the last couple of years where... I found if you took really thick um, sections of a trunk and planted those, they were much more successful. So I had one year where I took four sections out of one tree that was growing in my garden. All four of them have developed roots, and it's, and it's growing. Um, so I hope that that's not just a once-off, but, uh, but yeah, I've got the photographs to prove it. Right? Um, and I think if you're growing something in the field, you're going to have this trunk that you're going to throw away anyway. So you may as well try. Um, and all I can do is share what I've, what I've learned, and, but I can't guarantee success. It's, it's still, uh, I would say, too little known to be, to be able to give a real recipe for that. And then I'm also going to be talking about fused trunks and demonstrating a, 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 a tree with fused trunks later on, because you can see in many of those examples that I showed earlier on, those massive baobabs are often multi-trunked, and very often those trunks were fused. Okay, so this is one of the trees outside. Um, this was photograph taken during the winter. <coughs> this is what it looked like five years ago. So it was a, a very... Um, uninteresting spindly little trunk it was planted in the ground in the garden and it just grew this straight and uninteresting trunk that is quite a big plastic pot that's that's a i think a 25 or 30 liter plastic pot so it's, it's still quite substantially sized um uh trunk um and and it's the same girth as it is now it's it's grown no girth in it since i took it out the ground Okay, so, so that's what I'm, I'm hoping to share with you guys today, is to take this type of really material that doesn't look very promising at all and turn it into something like this. All right, so, so a little bit more about, uh, about baobabs. Um, these are my measurements from growing them in Durban. Okay, so you expect an 8 centimeter trunk after about 5 years. And, and I would say in Durban, they really have very favorable growth conditions. Um, in the ground, it's, it's significantly faster. Um, other thing that's very interesting about baobabs is that they start off with a simple leaf. As they mature, they start developing into trifoliate leaves and eventually um, as per digitata, five leaves, okay? They, they, so this is, this is the mature shaped leaf. Um, and those leaves are quite big, um, and, and 
so that's why this is a species that really you want to display in winter or just with buds on it like, it, like those ones outside I've got. Um, the branches and the, it, it are extremely strong and elastic. It is very difficult to wire these. Um, somebody was asking me earlier today, can you wire them? And I, I would say, you can, but you're going to sickle. It's, it's, you wire them, and you leave that wire in place, and three years later, you take the wire off, and the branch just goes back to its original position. You actually have to break those fibers inside the trunk, uh, inside the branch or inside the trunk, if you want it to stay in that position. Um, which is a bit nerve-wracking, right? You've got to wait, actually crack the thing, and then it'll stay in place. Or you've got to, we were talking about it um, uh, earlier this morning or yesterday, you've got to actually in some way cut or damage that section of, of branch, and then that callus will hold it in position. Um, but, but I think that there's, you know, behind it, there's a, there, there is biology behind some of this. And a lot of that strength comes from the fact that there's hydrostatic pressure inside the baobab. They, they store an enormous amount of water, and that's partly what gives them their strength. Um, another thing that is quite interesting and worth paying attention to is... Just because they don't like water in winter doesn't mean that they can survive in summer without water. Don't make that mistake of not watering your baobabs in summer. They, they need that water. They can be killed by not watering them. Um, Charles Seronio came down to Durban many years ago, and I remember him talking also about the theory of how to look after them in winter, especially in colder areas. Now, I cannot... I'm no expert in that because I live in Durban. So, you know, please, whatever I say about how you treat these trees in winter, you must, you must take with a big warning sign around. So, but what Charles said, who came from Pretoria, he said that those trees, you need to keep the, the, the fungi in the soil, those microorganisms that coexist with the baobabs, you need to keep them alive by having some amount of moisture in the water. It can't be bone, bone, bone dry. That's what Charles said. I can't, I can't vouch for that one way or another, but he was quite strong, he had quite strong opinions on that. Um, the other thing that's remarkable about them is the ability to survive ring barking, and that's an adaptation to surviving elephants. Um, so... The, it's, it is really rather fascinating because they're very different to, to, the, to other trees. They have got an, an, an ordinary tree or a conventional tree would just have a, a, a layer of um, cambium cells between the bark and the wood. Okay? Um, so it would be sitting somewhere there. And that is that single row of, of cambium cells that you learnt about at school biology that form the rings of the tree as it grows. These guys have got those same cambium cells distributed in the sapwood in the middle. So that means that they heal completely differently to other trees. If you cut a branch off of an oak tree or a fig tree or any other type of tree, that bark will have to roll over and it creates that little squirrel hole effect, and eventually it will close. But it, but it doesn't heal from the middle of that cut. Baobabs do. They heal almost, think of it almost to the way that your skin would heal if you were injured. Your skin doesn't roll over. <laughs> it heals from within. And these guys are the same. Um, also quite interesting, um, and, uh, and I think that this is, explains explain some, one of the things that I found with them is that that bark, if you look at it underneath, is quite green. It photosynthesizes. And what I found very frustrating is that often you, you, you get an opportunity to, to cut roots off of baobabs. And, those, and I always thought, well, you know, this is like a root of a fig. I, I'll surely be able to grow another tree from that. I haven't had any success with that. That root stays there, it heals over, and it just lives there. 
like a fat plant almost, forever. And it never sends any other branches off. And I, I've, I'm not sure, but I suspect it's something to do with the fact that that, that that root, the bark on that root is actually photosynthesizing. And for some reason, it doesn't trigger the growth of new branches. But it stays alive, which is quite remarkable. Okay, so the soil must be free draining if you want these things to stay alive. Very coarse river sand, washed river sand is what is, must make up the bulk of your, your mix. Um, I've spoken about planting them in the ground. You really need, if you want that trunk to grow quickly, there's nothing like growing it in the ground. You repot them in, at this time of the year or earlier or in winter. Um, and you'll see that we, if they're living in pots, they will start to push themselves out of the pot. And that's because of that big root growing under, under the soil. So every couple of years, you've got to pull it out the pot and cut that tuber off and seal it with, uh, or uh, put uh, flowers of sulfur on the cut so that it doesn't rot um, and, and replant it. They, they will handle that. But, you, but it's very important to manage rot in that, in that circumstance. So I've never, I've never done this. I know that some of you guys from, from other parts of the country dig your trees, your baobabs up during winter and wrap them up in hessian and store them in the dark, and that's how they, they survive. I've never had to do that in Durban. So, but please, 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 I'll, I'll keep repeating this. Remember that whatever advice I'm giving is for this climate. So I don't want you to go home and leave your trees out all winter and they frost and die. Um, so it's, I'm just telling you what works here. I mean, I remember Sean showing us years ago at his old place before he moved was he had his baobabs under the eaves of his house, but there was a leak in his gutter and that leaked onto one of the baobabs throughout winter, that little bit of moisture was dripping on that tree, and I think it killed it or, or it, it really suffered. So you don't want them, I don't go and deliberately water my trees in Durban in winter, but it, hey, it rains sometimes in July in winter. They stay outside. They, get, they catch the rain, the water drains out the bottom of the pot, it dries out, it's fine. No problem here, but we don't have those freezing conditions. But that's interesting to hear that 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 whole theory has been superseded. Okay. Um, so I've spoken about the way that they heal. This is an example of, of a trunk that's been cut off. So this is looking at it from the top. And you can see it healing up. And it, that really rather massive uh, cut, it just heals from within. It doesn't have to, you don't have to wait for it to roll over. Clip and grow, given the difficulty of wiring branches, ideally that's what you want to do with your branches, um, especially the, the, more, the finer branches. I think it's a total waste of time trying to wire those branches. The, the thicker, heavier branches, those are the ones that curve down that you saw in those photographs earlier on and the, the peony uh, uh, liner cut. Those are the ones that you really need to break and then put a guy wire on and so on. But the smaller branches, I don't think it's worth it. Rather, clip and grow. Um, right, and I'll talk about grafting and fusing earlier, uh, later on. So this is a very famous South African baobab. And what's beautiful about this is, is um, that there are photographs going back years and years and years so this is an 11, when it was 11 years old, about 25, 42 years old. It is a magnificent baobab bonsai, make no mistake. I love it. The ramification here is just is absolutely superb. But it has taken 42 years to get to that, to get to that point. And, and this tree um, also has got quite a smooth trunk, right? It doesn't really have that same fluted effect that you get on those those very ancient baobabs. So this is how I started. So um, these were some of my initial batch. This, this was after nine years. This is what my baobabs looked like, okay, from being grown from seed. They were, they were in relatively small pots. 
here's one of those roots that I was trying to grow that never sent out another leaf. <laughs> um, I really didn't know what I was doing, right? Um, yeah, just a, a few more photographs of those. Okay. Um, Andrew, you'll recognize that tree. <laughs> so, look, I was, you know, I, I still love this tree, eh? Um, and, uh, yeah, it gave, it, it's really given me a lot of joy, that tree, over the years. This is another one of those that I just persisted with and persisted with. So that's one of the trees that's, that's on show. It's, it's now a couple of years later. I should update the photograph here, I guess. Um, so this is the story. Um, I, and it's nice to have the photographs. That's another thing that I think is, is really useful. Guys, take lots of photographs of your trees, even if you think that they are not worth photographing, because much later on you will thank your, your previous self for making a record so that you can see what actually happened and how long it took. Okay, so this, uh, yeah, this tree here was also one of those original ones, but I planted it in the ground and thickened up the trunk and then let it, this was at a stage when it was starting to heal over and you can see the method here, basically letting it grow long branches and then cutting those back at the end of every season. Okay, so this is a little bit further progressed and further progressed and you can see that the cuts here were still quite crude but if, go and have a look at that tree and you'll see how it's healed over and you won't, wouldn't suspect that there was a, a flat cut at the top. Okay. And, and yeah, you can see here, this, it's now four years on, and this is even more healed up. Um, and you can see some of the method of being applied here. Because wire doesn't work, I was forcing those branches apart with, with wooden blocks in the middle. I've got a better example, and it'll, I'll show you exactly. Um, so this was the first one that I was starting to think that I need to do something differently, you know? Um, you can see the wooden blocks in here. Um, but, but this had already started to heal up at that point. So, so the branch structure was more or less there. Okay, so, so this is going back to that previous, ex previous example. Um, this was again one of those original ones that was looking quite miserable in a tiny pot. I planted it in the ground. After two or three growing seasons, it got nice and fat. Um, and you can see just how quickly they grow as well. Those who are not familiar with them. I mean, this was in December. By January, look at the, look at the growth. They grow rapidly. Okay, so same sort of thing happening, but that top, started to rot quite quickly. Although I'd painted wood glue across the top, it rotted back very quickly, but except for where the plant was alive. So I let those grow, and you can see this, it had rotted quite a lot here by the, this was <coughs> after another year, right? And you can see every year letting this grow out, but, it, but what was happening in the middle here, in the meantime, it was rotting, rotting away, and I was also, basically scratching away at anything that was, any dead wood that was left in there, which was very soft anyway. Then I started to cut from the top using a saw between where those branches had started to form. You can see there. And then using these, putting these wooden blocks in there, really forcing them in. And as I said, it's a little bit nerve-wracking, but pushing it until you can start to hear that, that section of trunk actually starting to crack. So the trick is to not break it completely, but you are breaking the fibers inside. So a lot of what you see on that tree outside as branches is actually part of the trunk originally that's been peeled outwards. Okay, and you can see continuation with the dates here. Um, obviously now during lockdown, this thing got properly tortured because there was nothing else to do. Um, so, um, but, but the concept, you can see the concept was, de was developing. Um, and 
then again, having another go at it, still in lockdown, starting to, I was starting to carve into where I'd, there were just boring saw cuts. Um, you can see here um, a top view of where these branches have been forced open. Um, and it was still in a plastic pot at that stage. Um, and then July last year, put into a ceramic pot for the first time with these guy wires. But you can see there's the basic structure of the trunk. But I've continued to work at, at, at this, right, to get that fluted effect. This is a top view. You can see a few cuts and things there now. Um, all right, so... Um, when you go and have a look at that tree, you will see that there are parts that are still quite fibrous on the outside. But, but some of those original cuts have healed over and there's now nice bark developing. So it's, it's not the completed article yet. It doesn't have that waxy look of all the bark. Um, those fibrous sections will either, the fibers will either eventually rot off and it'll heal from within. Um, and you'll get a much more natural looking trunk. So it is a little bit premature to be displaying it, I feel. It also needs more ramification, that tree, but it'll come. But I thought it was, because of this talk, I thought it's worth showing you guys. Okay, so this is just a, a view of it. Okay. So you can see there, some parts of it had actually started to heal quite nicely. But this has been done slowly. That is a crucial point, not all done at once. The other thing I mentioned is, you talked about grafting. I tried, in the early days, I had these miserable little skinny baobabs growing in pots, and I decided I'd fuse them. And I, did, I followed all the normal instructions, things that we do for figs, cut them, uh, bound them together, <coughs> and they just healed up and stayed separate. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried to fuse them, but, but it was pretty um, unrewarding and unsuccessful in my case. Um, so here's an example of what I, what I changed. I took a whole lot of these thin baobabs, this was a different batch of seeds, and I wired them together and put some cable ties on and planted them in the ground. And that, that aggressive growth, you can see how um, from, this is a, a year, you can see how that wire is dug in after a year. Um, and, and they started to fuse. And eventually just the growth really forced them to grow t together. But the only way that I've been successful at this is having them in the ground. I don't think that when they're in a pot that they're growing aggressively enough to actually force them to fuse. Okay, so this is the same tree a little bit further on. You can see I'm just allowing it to grow vigorously. These, these branches are like two and a half meters long. Um, and, and, and this is the tree that I'm going to work on a little bit later when Brett is doing his demo. I'll sit on the side here and work on this. So this has now been taken out of the ground, put in a big pot, but it is fully, fully fused, and you'll be able to see that later on. Okay, and, and, and you had a question about how long. Sorry, I flicked past this. About three years to get those, those two to fuse. So there's an enormous benefit here of having a lot of trees so, so that you can afford to experiment a bit with them. Um, grafting, I can only talk about the theory here because I haven't done it myself. Oh. So, um, you know, grafting is a very ancient technique. It's been around a, lo a long time, and um, I, I haven't tried this my myself with baobabs, but it does work. Okay. So, uh, this is a little case study. I brought some seeds back from Malawi, digitata, the same species that we get here in 2015. Um, just to show you the, the seed trays, you scratch the seeds, soak them in, in uh, warm water for a day or two, plant them, 
They germinated pretty well. Um, I must say that some, some of the seeds that didn't germinate from those seed trays, up to five years later, I was getting seeds waking up. So yeah, just be aware of that, that sometimes that can take a really long time. So when I said a lot of trees, yeah, I had like 80 or 90 of them. Get, getting a bit overwhelming, I must say. Um, and because I had so many of them, I decided, now I'm going to try and fuse them. Um, so others have been planted in the ground. And instead of waiting until the tree's been put in a pot and then carving them, what I've been doing with some of them is carving them while they're still planted in the ground because they will heal up so much faster. Um, so the method that I'm using here, I just take a, a, take a, uh, a drill bit, because it's really very soft, a drill, ordinary drill bit on a drill, or if you've got a die grinder, even better, like that chainsaw bit on a die grinder, and carving, um, fluting into the trunks. Um, so this is another example. So that's my little dog. Um, this is what it looked like growing in the ground right next to the neighbor's wall. I didn't tell them that a baobab growing next door, but yeah, they, it, it was pretty quick in the ground. Um, and you can see I'd carved away at it and all going according to plan. Um, last year, this is what I dug out of the ground. I mean, the root was massive. Eh? It, it was a real job getting this thing out the ground. You can see with the size of, the, of a chlorine bucket, um, the relative size of it, treated with uh, flowers of sulfur, and, and, and that's how all of those other ones have been treated. Okay. Um, and then planted, planted in a pot um, at the beginning of this year. This is the one where I got overconfident because I'd been succeeding with carving them, and um, I got too aggressive with this one. And carved it in April, okay, and it was starting to go into a dormant phase. What is not in the photograph is that in July, I was still carving it. It had lost all of its leaves at that point, and by August, it was dead. And there's nothing as, um, as pathetic as a dead baobab. Let me tell you, it's dead properly. There's no, like, coming home from that. So the main, the main lesson is this, of this is, and it, this applies to other trees as well, don't try and do too much at once. And I think specifically with the species, don't try and do all of this carving while they're dormant. Because they're not, they're not healing over. And, and uh, the, the early cuts I was sealing with wood glue, but... As I said, I was getting a bit sloppy and I wasn't sealing those cuts. Um, but I still don't think it's a good idea to carve them in the middle of winter. So, yeah, I took one for the team, killed my tree, but you've all got that bit of knowledge. Don't carve your baobab in, uh, in winter. Okay, so in summary, plant it in the ground. Look at the aesthetics of and the the proportions of mature trees and think about what you want to achieve in future. Um, I've spoken about the major wounds um, and the fusing and grafting and, and my other piece of advice is that they grow quickly, they germinate, my germination rate is about 30%, which is relatively good for, for trees, I believe. Um, plant plant a good number of seeds and get a good crop going and then you can really have fun and when a tree dies in you, it's not the end of the world because you've got many more to, to try with and you can try fusing them as well. There are a whole lot of lovely resources online um, um, just about the species and some, and some very interesting, um, uh, there's some also some quite interesting documentaries on, on YouTube on not turning them into bonsai, but just on what the species is capable of. Okay. Um, and a little bit of other reference material. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> so, 
I'm being very, I'm being very minimalistic now. But those, those will, and, and baobabs in the wild have got those, they've got those sort of fat rolls on them anyway. So I'm not particularly bothered about that because I know that over time, they'll, it'll become more natural. But, but, but I think that, that that is where those wires were. And you can see that it really has, it really has fused. You can see this one here, the one that's tall, is there. So that one I'm letting, I'm going to let grow. I'm not going to cut it off now. Um, I want that one to fatten up a little bit more inside there. Um, the other thing just that um, you can see from the bottom, I've just cleaned out because there was some, there was some really um, fine soil in there, some mud, and, and, a, and, and some of the original tissue from the tree. So I've just cleaned that out so that when I take it home, it will, and when I, after a couple of days, when I put it back in the soil, that um, it's, it, when I first heard, oh, you put sulfur on them, I was very new at Bonsai, and the only thing I'd heard of it was lime sulfur. No, 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 no. So just, if anybody is new at it, <laughs> flowers of sulfur is this stuff. It's powdered sulfur. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm like, you know, I'm not trying to insult everybody, but I made that mistake. And so, you know, two years later, I dug up my tree and it stank of lime sulfur. Is it dangerous from there? Well, they, only if you, only if you graft some branches into them. So if you take these, now, I've never been successful. I think, I think that that thing is quietly photosynthesizing without leaves and it'll stay like that forever unless you graft some branches in. And I mean, are there any particular, I mean, as I said, that was an instruction that I found on the web for grafting baobabs. I haven't done it. So yeah, guys, I'm not going to, um, uh, those of you who, were being pay, who weren't paying attention to Brett, um, would have noticed that I had a piece of wire on one of these branches. So, but that branch was, I broke the branch and then wired it. So that's, I think, the only circumstance under which wiring actually makes sense with branches. You've got to break it. It was a very, it was, a, it was like a branch that thick. And it was just broken in place. It's here somewhere. Yeah, you can see like like that one was broken in place. Yep. But would you purposely break it or yeah. would you make a cut? Well, I just I just broke it when it was very young and and thinner, but yeah, I, I more experimenting I reckon is required there. But um yeah, I mean I here I'm not particularly worried about any of the inverse tape or any of that sort of stuff. It's going to be a case of, of, um, of slowly refining what's going on here with the cuts. And, um, and it's still growing, and I'll put this back in a big pot so that it'll still grow aggressively and, and develop the ramification.